<laughs> all right, so first of all, for those of you uh, who we haven't met yet, my name is Dan, this is Derek. We work in the Junos group here at Juniper. Um, it's been a fascinating place to be. I've been, I've been the, the guy who's been at the vendor a little too long. Derek will give you some other interesting insights from uh, somebody who's just joined us more recently. But working on the vendor side, we start, <laughs> nice. So th <laughs> this is slide one out of uh, 372. Uh, it's a cloud of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay. So one of the interesting things about being in the Junos group is we have a lot of interesting stuff to work on. If you spend time in the bullpen where we work, every other day we get into deep conversations about different knobs that we can do to MPLS, what do we need to do to iterate on specific functionality inside of Junos. But we also get to ask another question, which is, what do we need to do inside the operating system to really make this much more effective over time? So for those of you who are here, last time you were in town, I spent some time looking at automation. Now, automation is particularly interesting for us, but maybe what we didn't answer is why do we think it's particularly cool? So if you ask the question, what do we need to do in terms of a network OS to really start laying the groundwork to do something more interesting, we have to start asking, what else do you expect out of these devices? So as a network engineer, we all log into a Junos device. You expect it to behave like a router or a switch, a security device. But is how much time do you actually spend just doing the baseline setup and configuration? Most of your interactions with this tend to be very operational. What are we doing to actually make this more a part of your ongoing operations? And to really figure out where we need to go, we need to take a step back and say, what do we really need to accomplish with this? So as Derek came on board, one of the fascinating things we've been able to do is ask some really tough questions about what does this OS need to do? What, fun what feature set and functionality do we need to fundamentally build into the operating system to make this more, more operationally efficient? So Derek, why don't you tell us, when you came on board, we started looking at where does Junos need to go? What are some of the first things you started thinking of in, in terms of how we really need to start enhancing the, Ju the uh, Junos operating system? So I think, uh, well, first thing is it needs to be, automation needs to be more accessible, right? And I think uh, we, we need to make it easier for people to understand it and to utilize it to make their job easier, right? So we kind of thought about this and we came up with an analogy, right? And I'm going to draw a picture here, like, uh, who's that guy in PBS with the afro? What was uh, it, Bob, Bob Ross. Ross? Bob Ross. Well, my afro is down here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to... Word of the day. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to draw a nice high mountain going into a beautiful valley. Happy little routers. Wasn't that Bob? Didn't he talk like... <laughs> Then we over, have over here like a dark forest of despair and agony where we all live. <laughs> it's our job to live here. Those are trees in case anyone's wondering. Yeah, those are trees <laughs> or broccoli. It's a forest, it's a dark forest of tall broccoli. <laughs> that's, that's more interesting. Then we have, this is the mountain of automation, right? But we're not calling it, actually automation is a terrible word. Uh, because it is, it kind of sucks. So we're gonna call it workflow. This is the mountain of workflow. And there's some people up here who know all about workflow and they have a telescope on a tripod. And they're looking out in the valley below and everything is awesome out here, by the way. There's like a river and unicorns, right? <laughs> There is, right? And they're pooping out awesomeness. And there's a little back. Then they have, like, come up here and there's a big horn, right? He's a little mutilated. And there's, like, pixies and fairy dust and children holding hands and singing. And over here, we have people in the dark forest of broccoli. And the analogy here, yeah. And the analogy here is this, right? Is he going somewhere with this? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll make a point here, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff you can do with automation. There's loads of it, right? You can seemingly solve world hunger, and the problem is 
most people don't know what the view is like up here because they're still way back here, right? They think automation is writing scripts. I have to learn a programming language, a slam a Perl script together, and then I automate something. Hooray. Unfortunately, there's a lot more to, being, to making effective workflow automations than just that. And the question is, if you're back here and you think that automation is writing a script, how can we start making you take steps towards the mountain so that you can get up here and start really uh, benefiting from you know, everything that comes with uh, a good workflow automation practice? So let's take a step back. What do we really mean by workflow? I mean, that's, workflow is kind of a term that gets thrown around a lot. So is automation. What's, what are we really trying to say here? What, do, what needs to happen in the network? What's the disconnect? So actually, I have, a, I have a, my only slide. It's my only slide. <laughs> Why is it? This shit's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> soak in for a second, right? Someone's watching your stream going, how did this get through legal? <laughs> Don't say that, man. So this is the thing. Like I said in the beginning, I worked 17 years building networks. And I'm going to tell you a story. And most of you, I think, will relate to this. Somebody calls, and they say, I have voice quality issues, right? We'll say her name is Ellen, and she's a customer relationship manager for a major account. And you ask Ellen, well, can you tell me the IP of your phone? And Ellen says, you're the network guy. Figure it out. And she hangs up the phone. <laughs> right? Yeah. That happens. But you're a big company, so you're stuck with a ticket, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't even know what her IP address is or where she's at or how to start troubleshooting this. So I know. I'll call the voice guy. So you pick up the phone. He's not there. You leave a message. You open a ticket. You're pretty much dead in the water. You can't do anything until the voice guy gets back to you. And you know, if he's not a total uh, asshole, he won't call back and say something like, well, why do you need this information, right? Because that happens. And what, so what is the problem there? What is the disconnect? And the disconnect is that in a typical enterprise, you have loads of management touch points, touch points for all the things you have deployed in your environment. So I mean, we have firewalls, IPS, IDS, load balancer, WAN optimization, identity management, storage, hypervisor management, system and app management, capacity and flow monitoring analysis tools. We have packet capture. Then we have external portals, right? You have cloud services you might be buying. If you buy cloud services, then you might have cloud management services that you buy. And those are all different portals you have to log into. You have a security dashboard that you might have to log into. Configuration management, uh, asset and telecom management, IPAM, video. You have like all these systems. Like, how many people have a bunch of those systems? All of you do. And the thing that's really terrible it's almost like Silicon Valley actually collectively hates everyone else. Because <laughs> none of these things like, have any concept of other things in the network. And yet, policies act like they do. So people will say stuff like, it'd be really great if all of, the, all of our call center agents went through this firewall, or this IPS, or over this dedicated link. Then you're left as a network engineer to figure out how to make that happen. Because you can't make a policy in a router that says, match on call center agents and forward out this path. You can't do that. So you end up, end up actually engineering your infrastructure after a policy, which is probably fluid. The policy will change. Then your architecture will be irrelevant. So you know, that's a huge issue right there. Nothing can really understand anything else. This is a fundamental problem in IT. And this is why, uh, as Enterprises grow, and these systems uh, get deployed in larger and larger like, you know, deployments. The management plane of these things, they don't scale. Because if they did, you wouldn't have to suddenly have silos. Well, our voice deployment is so large, but now we need a voice team. And people 
who are especially trained to manage voice. So when something breaks, you end up with that phone game and it takes, it could take weeks to solve Ellen's problem. And it shouldn't, it should not take that long. So that's the IT staff. And they're looking at all of these things and that is literally what they're thinking. What the hell is broken now, right? Why is this happening to me? How badly is this shit going to hit the fan? I'm allowed to say that, right? You just did. You just did. <laughs> oh well. You know that now we're gonna have me tagged by YouTube for BG, right? Really? Good for you. Can we bleep him? It's a first. It'll be a first. Beep. I'm Probably also drinking be beer. First. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a backup just in case I go through that one. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and then the last thing, how can I stop the hurt, right? Because that's, that's what you're thinking. And no one can answer any real questions about what happened, right? So if you're like a manager and something blows up and you're like, well, who was impacted? And then no one can answer that. They're all looking around like, ooh, ooh, ooh. it's fixed. Let's just move on with their lives, right? It's hard, like IT is hard. So all the way on the far left, this is really what's kind of happening. This is where all this interest in magical potions comes from. You have a CDO, CIO director architect, and he's saying, why is this so hard? We need cloud, we need SDN, we need something, anything. And there's people ready to sell them anything, right? This is gonna solve all your problems. If you take all of this in, you think about it, are those things going to solve that problem? They're not going to solve that problem. That's a fact. So if you're, but automation, right, by the way, automation can help with that problem. It may not solve the problem, but there are things you can do with automation to make it easier to avoid those situations where you can't get information or it takes forever to get the information. You gotta coordinate troubleshooting activities, blah, 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 blah. What can you do to make it easier to operate your infrastructure? It's not about the network. It's about your infrastructure. Your network operates in the context of an infrastructure. It's there to, to deliver applications. Your servers, your storage, the network, it's all there so that Ellen, who can barely operate an iPad, can log in and check her email and call and not be able to you know, press a button to tell me her IP address on her phone. It's all about her, not you. This meeting's about you though, you guys are special. This NFT, that's true. So like, what can we do then? Like how can we use automation? How can we get out of this dark forest of broccoli despair with all these things that don't interoperate and don't make sense and start moving up the mountain so that we can improve our operational effectiveness. Tell me, Derek, I wanna climb the mountain. You wanna climb the mountain? Yes. <laughs> well, we actually, uh, we were actually trying to come up with a word for how, you know, what would we be called? Workflow Sherpas. <laughs> Workflow Sherpas. Is that funny, Tom? Don't spit beer on your MacBook, okay? <laughs> actually, coming with the good stuff. Oh, no, workflow Sherpa was mine. It was, it's yours. <laughs> workflow Sherpa was his. Workflow Sherpa was his. Yours is wonderful. <laughs> so this is our slide, our one slide that I spent half a day working on. Thanks, boss. Hey. <laughs> what is something cool that we can do. Well, if you think automation is about scripting, right? Uh, a lot of times, uh, what happened, I've been through this journey, right? And I've actually helped other people. I've done consulting, I've talked to people blah, 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 about how to do workflow automation stuff. And one common thing that people get in their head is, well, if I write an automation, right? I'm gonna write an automation for this you know, project I'm doing where I gotta convert a bunch of stuff and they end up writing like an application in Perl and it's like 50,000 lines and it does all this stuff and it gets really complicated. And you really, that's not how to do automation. What you wanna do with automation is little things that you can string together if you want to, right? And you should start off small because it's easier, 
but also later, when you're doing more complicated stuff, you can string those little things together in ways that make sense rather than writing a 50,000 page application. So we talked about workflow the last time we were here, well not we, Dan, and you know, we all went away, we came back, so maybe this time we want to kind of show you how to start approaching it. And I have, should I do the demo? Sure. I'm going to do the demo. Let's do it. Let's well, do be, demo. before we do the demo, let's, let's take a look at what this really means. We this demo is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. I saw it. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> it's going to work. <laughs> or I'm going to chug both those beers. I think it, if it does work, I might chug, chug the beers in here. <laughs> yeah. So if we bring it back to what we opened up with, the question is, what are we doing as a vendor? If we know that there's a mountain, we know there's a problem, and we know that there's specific things we can help with. The question is, what do we bring out to the market? How do we actually make your lives easier? We built Junos Automation many years ago. It's actually been out there for quite a while. We showed you some cool demos last time. And a lot of these demos, we have a whole open source site. You can download a bunch of cool stuff. We showed you this little thing about BGP, how it automatically goes and logs into a router and tells you what's wrong with the BGP sessions. It's very point oriented and it, it kind of sticks inside of the network infrastructure. There's actually a much bigger thing going on though. And I think one of the things that as Derek and I and the rest of the team have been looking at this, there's something changing in the industry. We've always been focused on the network. It's always about what can we do to make a router or switch better? What can we do to have a cooler protocol? What can we do to enhance the way multicast works? We have some great discussions about gory details of draft rows and other things like that in the bullpen. But in the end, does that make your life actually easier? No. No, it doesn't. That's what you said last time. That's what I see. So what are we going to do about this? How are we going to make Junos more useful for you? Well, part of this is also realizing that we don't always need to focus on the network itself. What is it that's hardest to do? Is it doing an operation inside the router or inside the switch? Or is it actually trying to connect some of those dots outside of the network? Where is the real value? Where can we really start adding some value here? So we started looking at this, and I, I, there's a little challenge here. We said, what can we do to show something really cool with automation? And you turned this around in how many hours? I got here on Wednesday and nothing was working. <laughs> and um, right before I hung out with you guys and drank all that stuff, <laughs> which I'm feeling right now, um, I got three little tools working that are, that are kind of cool that would make people's lives just a little bit easier, right? To be fair, they are using some new functionality that we added, though. They are. They are using. So, in Junos 12.2, uh, there was some stuff added to automation, which made it slightly more awesome. Actually, two things happened. Uh, the first thing is you can make curl calls out of the scripts. That is awesome. And actually, the three things I wrote uh, are all based on curl calls. And the second thing that actually, no, we'll hold off on the second thing. The second thing is way awesome, but I'm going to hold on. I'm let's show all three. Show all three? Yeah, let's show all three. Let's show the first one. Can we hand all three at once? <laughs> is it, if it is that awesome. I don't know, can you? <laughs> well, they're, they're in graduated they levels awesome. of awesome. Like, we're, we're bringing you up slowly. It, it, Do we have enough beer if it doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs> There's scotch back in the queue. <laughs> I'm a, you know what? I've been sitting back there doing this over and over. Like, so here we go. Slow clap this one. <laughs> you can start off with the most awesome one. We gotta work our way up. Oh, you know what? Yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's work our way up, Dan. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So, this is the first thing, right? Before we do that, let's look at this command. Right? Pretty straightforward. Mac table, some VLANs, some MAC addresses. This is the thing. This is, this is like, 
this kills me. This is why I got so passionate about SCN and network programmability stuff. That's why I like throwing underwear or having underwear thrown at me. The thing is this, for what, how many years? How many years has it been since Ethernet switching came out? Anyone? 30 years. You. 30 years. You were still old when it happened, so you were even older. No, I, I installed my first Calpana switch in 1996. 1996. So we're talking 10 to 16 years, right? 16, 17, whatever the math, math is. <laughs> 16 years, and we still have this meaningless blob of crap for a Mac table. Look at, does that mean anything to anyone? Yeah, it's meant to. Ten years ago. Oh, it's meant to? Yeah, we, 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 we're trying to understand. I think I see a couple of Cisco devices. We, we have the ones that are set up, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the fact of the matter is if, you, right. if you're operating a large data center and you're looking at a, you know, an aggregation switch, there's pages of these and they're meaningless. You don't know what all that stuff is. If you're fortunate enough to have three things in your network, you may know all the MAC addresses. I'm guessing nobody has that convenience. So. What if we could do something like this? Work. Long live curl. <laughs> Better work. You're yelling at us for not memorizing Mac addresses. Oh, we had that <laughs> memorized. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Wow. Okay. Simple, like. For some of you, you'll look at this and like, I don't care who made the NIC on the thing attached to my switch, but some of you will look at it and say, oh, that's kind of cool. I know what's attached. I know what devices might be attached to the network. That's interesting information to know, possibly better to know, than a MAC address. Yeah. What's a slim device? It's a music player. It's a music. That's not even interesting. There's ICP electronics, a bunch of VMware Inc. stuff, right? Um, and if you look at the VMware Inc. stuff, it's all on the same port, so we're probably assuming those are all VMs, right? Some Juniper Network stuff, that's probably the router or default gateway or firewall on this network. <coughs> you have something to go on other than a bunch of hexadecimal crap. So you can do a little bit better than that. We should play the Jeopardy theme music while we wait for this. <laughs> right? So now, actually, I got one better than that. Because that's still kind of messy. Ooh, beer time while I'm waiting. That's right? So now those are the names of the VMs for those MAC addresses. Right? Master. Master. <laughs> it should be Beastmaster. So again, is it gonna, you know, change the face of networking? No, but it's a little more information than just MAC addresses, and this would be useful, right? I, actually the last one I would have killed for in my last job because we have so many things attached to our stuff. This I would have killed for. This is the reason why I wrote these three things actually. I thought about three three things for some reason, because of process, because of animosity between <coughs> network and some other silo, it was just hard to get this information uh, and you know, move on with your life when you're doing stuff. VM names, but you know, that's kind of been done before. So how does this work? What just happened here? Oh, you want me to, what just happened? Yeah, show us the magic. <laughs> okay, yes, <I> no. <laughs> I'll show you the magic. <laughs> so I wrote a very simple Slack script, right? Everyone knows, uh, I think you should know what Slack is by now. The scripting language on a Juno's box is based on a really terrible language <laughs> called Exalt. It's Exalt. Has anyone tried to use, every, and anyone knows what Exalt is? Right? It's not the, you do. Yes. Thank you. So Exalt is uh, actually not the easiest language in the world to learn. So, uh, oh, Ivan likes it. <laughs> so we have, um, we have a guy here uh, at Juniper that actually, uh, his name is Bill Schaefer, and he went through a lot of trouble 
of making Perl-like shorthand uh, sort of syntax that can easily be translated into Exalt. And so this is like a Perl-like version of Exalt that you're looking at. And this script does very little, actually. All it does is collect output from a command, right? That's what the output is. And then it encodes it, URI encodes it with the percent signs and all that. Then basically makes a curl call with it out, out to a server. That's all it does. And the reason why we're not doing lots of crazy processing on the text and all that on this box is because why do that? This is a low-end switch. It could be a low-end firewall. This script should do as little as possible and send the work elsewhere. Plus, you can update what it's calling as things progress so you don't have to constantly keep pushing that stuff down into the switch. Yes, this is exactly right. You're skipping ahead. Um, so you can actually, the output from any command, you can, uh, you know, it wasn't just Ethernet switching table. I'll show you another can, a command in a second. But you can take the output of any command with this and send it off to a server. So let's look at the thing that does the work. Everyone know what light? Yep. Light, how do you pronounce that? Light right. Um, Web right, exactly. So you know that um, it, it has uh, mods for CGI. You can do Python. You can actually write your own little tools in any language you want. And I chose Perl in this situation. So this is the, like for the OUI one, this is the script that does the magic, right? Well, the first page is all just CGI processing. You have to decode it and do whatever. That's just standard stuff you can grab over. Yeah, exactly. You can cut and paste most of this from anywhere on the internet. Yeah. Right? Google is your friend. So I, uh, it's just a very simple Perl script that, well, the regex is not necessarily simple. But this regex says match on a MAC address. And then for each one, each MAC address you find, call a function that replaces the MAC address with the name of the vendor. That's essentially what the script does. Very simple, very small script. It does something very discreet, right? Takes a MAC address, gives you a vendor. The Mac VM one, uh, again, with the CGI stuff, is a little more. Uh, yes, password. Is it? <laughs> That's my wife. She was, she was 28 when I met her. I don't, you know what, don't judge me, I don't care. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, we have, you know, a little loop um, that logs into uh, vCenter or ESX and it just pulls down all of the uh, VMs and makes a little hash, you know, MAC address and VMs. Then we take the input and we look for those MAC addresses and then we modify, you know, we create the output basically that prints the name of the VM along with the output. Very simple, right? It's a theme here with all three of these. It takes definite input and creates output in a very uh, easily understandable way. That's essentially how this works. I mean, it's pretty simple. And that's why the curl call support and told that too is awesome because now you can, you can do stuff like this. Bless you. <laughs> okay, can I show him the really cool one now? Yeah, so Derek wrote these one at a time, by the way. So at first he went back and wrote the OUI one. It's like, wow, that's really cool. And then the next thing, probably what, an hour later, maybe half an hour later, we had the one that was automatically pulling information. We had VMs working. This is, we started getting really excited about this stuff. Why is this so awesome? It's not because we're just running a script on the device. It's because we've actually broken through a little wall here. The whole point of this is how do we start connecting the network with systems outside the network? Your network is not running in isolation. You hire Cloud <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not everybody can be that lucky. So we have to look at what do we start doing to make this easier to use. Now, if this is cool, if the whole idea is that we're starting to pull information from somewhere else, what is even more meaningful? And there's actually, there's, yeah, there's a story behind where this one came from, right? Which one? The next one. Oh, the phone one? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, for real, there was a, there was a whole thing with Ellen. 
at a previous job. I made that name up, by the way. But this really happened. And she called in on a Monday with phone problems. And because of change control and because of silos, we had open tickets with other help desks, internal to our own company, we're supposed to be a team. It took two weeks to solve her problem. Two weeks to solve her problem. And it was all process. It was literally encumbered by the fact that we had grown so large, we had silos for every piece of our infrastructure, and none of them spoke the same language, right? It's, and you know what happened for real? This happened. When I actually called the voice help desk because of animosity between the voice help desk and the network team, I'm like, I just need to know her IP address because she's having an issue. I'm going to make sure it's not the network. Well, why do you need that information? I just told you I need that information. Well, maybe you should take a closer look at the network before you call here. It's not a voice issue. All I want to know is her IP address. <laughs> why? Why? That, wow, that, that frustration, I'll never forget that. Because it, you know, that's, it defines IT these days, right? That's where this next script came from. Quick question for you, Derek. Yeah. Uh, looks like, I can't see all the script, but it looks like basically when you run that op CC command, it basically takes all the output, passes it off to your script. Yep. So then, like here, your inline variable, it's like uh, each line of the output, and then you just run whatever you have to replace it. So do you get the full output of the command passed off to your script, so then you manipulate it however you want, and then the output from your script is fed back in. That's what. That's exactly right. Yep. And we leave all the. Like said. And it's you know this script is short. I mean this is it took he was right it took like an hour to do the VM one. I just. Because vendors document stuff, right? Like VMware, I just went to their website and I'm like, well, how would I do this? How would I get the MAC addresses of the VMs? And it's actually, if you Google that, find VM by MAC or find MAC by VM, Perl, VMware, they put that kind of stuff in Google, about 100 people have done this and have example scripts of their own. That's, what, that's the magic of the internet. It's magic. <laughs> and Perl. It's because you don't really have to work that hard to make something this simple. And these regexes, a lot of these, I just cut and paste off the internet. I am not that awesome at regex. So, let's do the next one. Does anyone here do SIP in their network? Do SIP? SIP, yep. SIP S, S I P. You do SIP? Mm -hmm. SIP? SIP? Yeah, cool. So um, this is actually something I wanted to, this is kind of cool. Metric crap ton of I, In the course of setting this up, actually it took longer for me to get this set up. I installed a SIP PDX uh, in this lab and then um, had to find an open source phone that actually worked because all those projects were abandoned. And I found this tool and it's really cool. It's called J or uh, it's called PJSUA. And uh, if you do SIP stuff, what it is is a Linux command line SIP test set. It's like a soft phone test set. And awesome. it is actually awesome. And you're about to see it. That's it. You can make calls. And, and it actually, as you do any of these operations, it actually dumps the SIP stuff to the screen so you can actually see the messages going back and forth. That's pretty neat. Yeah, uh, PJSUA. Okay. PJSUA. Neat. That's great for nest. That'd be great for nested labs. I'm online, right? It just registered to the PBX, and yeah, there's all the SIP stuff that went back and forth in between the, uh, the test set and the PBX. So let's show you something cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Right? That was awesome. You yeah. got, you got yeah. the sky's the limit from here. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way. Show ARP. Pretty, uh, whatever, 
bunch of IP addresses, Mac tells me nothing about what it is, nothing. For someone who's not a very proficient scripter, how, what's, is there any limitations of what you can and can't do? Like, is it a full, you say it's a, that salt engine before. Um, you gotta be it, can you just push it to do crazy things, or is, it, is there a limit of how far it can go? <coughs> In terms of the automation? Yes. Um, do you need to quote it there? It's, uh, is the question scale, or is the question of what stuff you can query? What can you query? Like, yeah. do, do you limit, if, if I pick up a Trinos box and started playing around and tried things, are there things you stop me doing because it's pretty crazy stuff? Because you can do, or you can have a whole mindset of things to do, or is it uh, limited by commands that you can actually look up? So now you're venturing into another interesting place, and this is one of the things we wanted to talk about, which is how do we productize this? How do we make this something you can use? And, I, and you actually said something else which was interesting is if you're not a native scripter, how do you start well, to take advantage I, of this I stuff? understand what's yeah. going on, but I can't so, sit there and go or type it out. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. the Junos yeah. environment itself is, re is relatively self-contained. What it really is is a method for you to manipulate XML data structures inside. Yeah. So it's always been limited towards the commands and the data that you can get into and out of Junos and the configurations you can set. What has been added first was the ability to make an RPC call to another yep. device and you talk to another script. That's what we showed last time. Okay. What is new here is curl. Now curl is now your ticket out of the box. So in this case, whatever data you can access directly using curl, you can start to manipulate. Once you have it inside, you can then manipulate it inside of the Slack's language. What's relatively cool about this though is also the realization that you don't always have to do the logic in the same place. We've always thought of automation as how do we build smarts that run inside of the switch or the router. And then you need to look at how much memory do you have, how, mu how many CPU cycles are you going to use for automation, and could that potentially start to interfere with something else. I would counter and say a lot of service providers actually think of how they can put automation and intelligence outside of the router and program it. Exactly. So, this, so as Derek was starting to look at this stuff, what got particularly interesting is realizing you only really need to start connecting the network devices to something else. I don't want to download large amounts of data and crunch that at the same time I'm trying to reconverge VGP. So we have the ability to start making these calls with the outside world. There's something else we also want to mention, and that is that as we start looking at where do we run these individual functions, where does it make sense? So in this case, this one script, what's particularly cool about it is it's really simple, it's just a stub that runs on this switch and all the smarts happens on an external device. In this case, just in light HTTPD. Oh, I'm putting the what? wrong password in. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's not <laughs> Melissa28. Well, why, 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 <laughs> why, why not, so we, we put Carl into mm -hmm. the device to make right. the device smarter to mm -hmm. enrich the data that existed natively. Right. Why are we, why not pull that Mac table mm -hmm. from the device Two, onto a Linux server three. and enrich it Four. there where Carl has existed for years. So you're actually bringing up the key point. So this is where it gets from what can we do versus what do you want to build out. Yeah. So as a vendor, we're trying to do two things. And, and I, I'm going to take a step back and actually say, what are we going to do as a vendor to enable you to do really cool things on the network? One, we want to make the data in the network device as accessible as possible. We've started out by making it all XML, and we've given you new ways to interact with that. That's where NetConf came from. Now automation allows you to manipulate that data on box. The next question is, how do you then, if you're, if you're going to actually start manipulating with this, uh, the data on the box, does it make sense to run on the box? Are you now trying to connect the box to something else? <laughs> the password is password. Nice. Excellent. <laughs> What's the password in your luggage? <laughs> one, one. one, two, three, four, or two. Um, I am an so, identity yeah, the, management So the right case. answer is, we don't know. The right answer is it depends on the application you're trying to build. Right exactly. So what we want to be able to do is give you more ways to run logic in different places and also start to break up that logic. Here it makes a lot of sense to be able to attach this contextualization function to a command. And here it's flexible. You can run it on any command. 
but there's a lot of other things that you may actually not want to run on the device itself. That actually you, you got to push that script to every switch in your network, right? Absolutely. It's also a management problem. How do we now you have to keep track of what OS version is running on the device, which version of the config do you have, and then where have you pre-positioned all these scripts in different places? So where does it make sense to position some of this logic? So what's particularly cool here is the realization you don't have to put everything on the device itself. And you can also make much more interesting, flexible things happen if you do the processing somewhere else. So this is what was supposed to happen. Wow. Oh, there's not that much to chug. We'll get some more for you. He's got a redundant backup already. I know. Um, so instead of uh, just having nothing, it actually tells me the name of the person and their phone extension. For that device. The IP of the, the SIP endpoint mm -hmm. against the MAC address, IP address, mm -hmm. port, and, and then rip that out of the SIP registrar. Yeah. Bravo. So that, that means, so essentially coming around and summing up, you not, don't have to bother with Alan's skills. Alan. I don't have to call the voice help desk. Yes. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the it, there's no cross silo. Yeah. It's more, not so much calling the end user, it's just not talking to the other silo. That's the real aim, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean, perfect. and every organization as they grow, like their individual processes and challenge will vary, right? So this might not be particularly useful if the network guys also have access to a PBX, but they may not. Yeah. Or it may not be useful if they know somebody and the, they can just call, it'll just tell them, right? And be. Isn't it a lot more useful as a script to give the help desk? You have to say to the help desk people, run the script before you send me the ticket. Right. And well, then you get the ticket, it would have the MAC address, the IP address, the VLAN number, and the users and the user's name mapped to where it is, saying there's a problem on the network. And you take one look at that and you go, oh, that's that switch. That's been playing up all week. Or we've had five cases from that person. You could even make a menu and macro that. What people have done this menu. already with SNMP, so mm -hmm. I guess we're... What, what you're seeing here is something that's always been in the network, but yeah, very I mean, rarely been able to make it extracting work. ARP and forwarding cables and matching them up and empowering the help desk and stripping mm -hmm. out, you know, SIP endpoints. Mm -hmm. Shipping out all sorts of data to empower the help desk, empower the level one tech, because we don't want level one tech logging into the switch, because mm -hmm. they're dangerous, right? So I guess how how does this? Those are the management so, tools we talked about. Well, so you're talking about something very users. specific, right? So I'll tell you why. So this again for you. I'm not like it. But. Right for you, this might not be. You're okay. You're thinking, what's the big deal? But there are some people like Greg. They're looking at this. and Wow, I would kill to have this. I did this. I actually demoed this yesterday for a customer. They didn't care about VMs at all. We're not interested in VM names, right? But then they saw the phone thing, and they said they would deploy that tomorrow if they could. Because each organization has their own challenges, right? I mean, this is useful for someone. That's why you make little tools, little tools that help you. And if you go back to that, if I go back to this diagram, and you actually think about how many systems there are, management touch points there are, you know what? OK, you might have some tools that do some voice stuff or do some hypervisor stuff. But what about storage or you know, blah, 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 and other things, right? You may not have that. And that, OK, now you, if there's an API, and guess what? There usually is. And usually, there's a Perl, Python, or Ruby library for it. You can write a script that's useful for you for that thing so that you can get that information without having to log into something you maybe not, don't even know how to use, right? Or it's outsourced, even. And you can just get that one little, that's all you need to know. What is what? So there's one other point though. If I, yeah, so there, there's a subtle thing that you mentioned that I actually want to drill in on. Yes, stuff like this has been done before. The question that we're trying to answer though is how does the network become a part of this type of solution? The way these solutions normally work is they're deployed off box and they go scrape information from the network devices. The real strategy here is how do we start looking at how we can make Junos itself part of a larger system? So the real, the real benefit here is not all the magic on the back end. The real benefit here is this is an extension to a CLI command that actually runs on a switch. You can actually log into the device and now pull context in that device as you're troubleshooting from external data sources and not always have to go and interface with an external box to do it. Now this is just an example of how you can do this. But I think that's really what we're trying to get at is we're trying to make the network more a part of these external systems. And that's, I think, where we have a lot of opportunity to create some enhancements inside of Junos. So, so it sounds like Juniper's looking to add additional tools inside. So, personally, I'd rather see you guys ship, like, if you're going to 
you're going to throw in some some extra scripting into the the shipping OS, just go ahead and do that. We're talking you know 20, 30, 40 minute scripts. Roll those in there. Add some extra feature set, right? So um, if we had a PowerPoint deck, I would accuse you of having read ahead in our presentation. Right, an associate for whatever, right? So what you're saying is dead on. We were able to do this, by the way, for this demo, because we have a Derek. And we are lucky to have Derek, because he was able to do this in no time at all. But there's two things we need to do as a vendor. And remember what we said opening up in this discussion. The whole point of this is what are we doing to make Junos more powerful and more integrated with your systems? There's actually two things we need to do as a vendor. And now I'm putting my strategic hat on. This is what do we do with Junos in the next three to five years to make this OS fundamentally more interesting? We need to do two things. Exactly what we've been talking about here. How do we give better toolkits? And there are people that want to use these toolkits. We had a session in this room, what is it, one or two weeks ago, where we actually had a bunch of customers from around, the, from around the country who came in, a lot of our large customers, and were telling us what we need to do. And we could literally draw a line down the room. And we, about 20% of those customers truly believe that they need to spend a significant amount of resources in developing their own operational systems. They have a significant DevOps spend they invest in that operational side of their network. And they're willing to take on the task of using these tools and building cool things. We know that we need to service those customers because they, they're our big customers. And they do really cool stuff. And most importantly, they, just like Derek, can show us amazing things that we can do. But that's going to solve the problem for about the 20th percentile of our customers. As a vendor, what else do we need to do to solve the problem for, everything, for everybody else? We also need to do exactly what you just said, which is how do we take some of this awesome and start to package it up? So right now, what we've shown you is a demo. And it worked. Asterisk, there was a password, but it worked. <laughs> Sorry, Derek. <laughs> but this is not a feature. There, one of the things, as you've been on the vendor side for a long time, there's a big difference between something that you can throw together, and something that is an actual feature that we can ship out and have a large number of people use. And this is the other key part of where we want to take Junos. So we know that there are things like this that we can build inside of the operating system that will have direct impact on people's lives. And just do simple things. We can make simple things easier. Just like with this demo of pulling VM names and associating them with MAC addresses. That's cool. I'd run that at home. It's awesome. It's really, it's a nice feature to have inside the operating system. We're always looking at what can we do to improve the operational aspects of Junos. How do we make Junos as awesome as it, like when Junos first came out, it was an awesome new CLI. It really changed the way you could interact with a the, with the router. But we did that in 1998. How do we continue that? Right. I mean, basic was a cool. Yeah, awesome. basic was awesome. <laughs> and then the line number got annoying. And then you did you know, 10, 11, 12, and then you want to insert in the middle. So, so, so what happened there? What do, I mean, what do we do to get past? Just walk so, I think a, yeah, I think a programming yeah. so, is a good place to start. So we do, we do two things. We want to build a toolkit that we can build things out of. The first one of which is actually a pretty big step for us as a vendor. Realizing that sometimes it's not us that actually come up with the good ideas. That's kind of a tough thing to swallow if you're at a vendor. We always, I mean, a lot of our features, we develop here, we see you know, we can create this awesome new knob to make MPLS failover faster, and we know exactly how it works, so we can do that. But as vendors, we're not the experts in how you run your network. The tough thing to actually get across is realizing there's a lot of knowledge in terms of how you can make your network operations better that other people can help us with. We want to create tools to help people show us how these, how these feature sets should work. The next one of which is when we do develop something, how do we get it out to you? This is a really interesting thing. I would love to see this as a native Junos feature. But what if you need it to be something slightly different? How do we take this and create a product out of exactly something like this? You don't so, create a community and share scripts, right? We already did that. Really? Yeah, it exists. Okay. And we have some really cool stuff. The BGP diagnostic thing that I showed you last time came from that community. Yeah. What we want to do is be able to pull the best stuff out there that uses this toolkit. I mean, if you look at what we built, yeah. this is fundamentally not really that different from something that we could code up and see as part of our management team and, and the CLI. We could do that. We could take this and build it into the CLI. 
And maybe that's ultimately where this goes. But how do we start to get people using this and start to understand what are the best things to start to promote up into features? Part of this is realizing that this is just a toolkit. We can actually build products out of this. Now, Derek said something pretty interesting. Is I, you mentioned it earlier, and I know we had talked about this at the customer in the EVC last time, was if you're going to build something, let's say you want to create a solution that gives you good contextualization for everything in the network. You want it to talk to your hypervisors. You want to talk to your voice system. That's a whole product. You can go to a company that does that all for you. And they're going to build a solution that they went through and created all this feature set and functionality, and you can buy it and you can plug it in. But that's now a big heavyweight thing. There's another way to solve this problem. We can look at each one of these discrete pieces, and instead of trying to deliver you one big product, we think there's places to do that, but I think a lot of this workflow stuff, the realization is we don't always need a big product to solve your problem. We can actually get a lot of value by building small things. Think of it like building Legos. If we can build you Legos where this little Lego allows you to connect to something and contextualize something in the CLI automatically. That's all it does. It's not, it's not earth shattering. It just connects to an outside data source and you can feed it whatever information you want. But that's a Lego. How do we make another Lego? And maybe that Lego helps you automatically do something else that's just a little difficult. But it doesn't do anything but that. There's another interesting problem. That is no two people run a network the same way. So whatever big solution we built would be self-selected to work with one company. So if we can build smaller pieces that people can actually start plugging in and use, it actually allows you to pick and choose exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Now, we can even take those and build something bigger out of them. So this is actually the other half. We know we have to build toolkits that allow us to do can interesting things. So the hard part about this for most network engineers is the actual server side. Getting mm -hmm. the Linux server built with the HTTP and yep. getting some Perl scripts on it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a way to package that up into like a VM image or something that we could. Wow. You said the packaging word. That, that's another interesting one. It is, yeah. Just, you know, and then there's like a bunch of sort of scripts there that you can use. So a lot of engineers aren't, hmm. and networking engineers don't actually train on things like installing Linux. No, Getting they a don't. Web server configured. So we say like a Juniper toolbox. Like a, a bit of a, and a, but it's not so much a toolbox, but a starting point to hack on. Mm -hmm. So you've got a bunch of starting point scripts. Here's a VM, drop that onto your desktop in, 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 the, in the VM view player thing, right? Well, and then start running some stuff. Just look at the land. Virtual appliances. I can actually think of a valid use case. So we're, we're at another networking vendor that's, that's not the dominant one. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't piss anyone off there with that statement. But uh, <laughs> not, not, the, not the big one, the one that has a whole <laughs> bunch of offices on the street. Um, and they'd written about 200 lines of code to handle networking instantiation for uh, VMs in quantum. Mm -hmm. And it, it, putting a plug-in into quantum smart, right? Mm -hmm. You could actually move most of that code in, into this. Hmm. Absolutely. Very, very easily, actually. Um, and you know, depending how, how you know, when you look at when you look at that, you know, the ability to actually you know take some user-generated code. I guess you're not a user; you're employee now. Um, but use that to kind of e extend the platform. What happens if it even is employee-generated code? What's that? What happens if it even is employee-generated code? How do we actually make products out of this? So to your point, where do, what do we actually do with this? Actually, you know what? Aside from OpenStack, you can make a list, right? CloudStack, Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, Yang. Yeah. I mean, how many things are out there that people use to automate and do automation, like, stuffy stuff? Well, I mean, I think you can look at F5 as, as... It's a technical term, stuffy stuff. I mean, look at F5, F5 with Dev Central, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know it's putting, putting the everyone, us versus them, them versus us aside. You know, that, that the ability to leverage a community um, to, to extend your infrastructure into their application creates value of, you know, to the definition, what is ours, what is theirs, right? But at the end of the day, it's so they buy your stuff, right? Ex extend your infrastructure into your application. You know, um, this is the thing. I actually came to Juniper because I believe what you just said, I believe, is the future of IT. I agree. I believe with it, every fiber of my being. I think this kind of stuff, this is very simple, yeah. right? Because we're back here. We're in the broccoli of despair forest, right? <laughs> it, it, it does get better than this, but it takes time to build a practice, to understand it, to start really take, leveraging what you can do with it to get up here. To steam your broccoli. Yeah. 
Right. So add some cheese. So you know, there happens to be something that uh, is really awesome. That's really cool, actually. This HTTP server is actually uh, part of a thing that we call Juice, J-U-I-S-E. And for like, this makes me so happy. Like, I think about this when I want to go to sleep. Seriously, I'm like, oh, I can't believe they did that. Oh, everything is great. Juniper released Juice as an open source tool, and you can download it from Google. And it's basically a CentOS uh, package that you can install. And it has a centralized uh, component where you can actually build scripts and test them before you deploy them in your network, in Slacks, if you want, or Perl, or whatever you want to do, because you have that, that HTTP daemon. And that server can actually make netconf calls to those boxes. And it's like optimized for that purpose. Which, or any box that receives NetConf. Not that there are any other vendors that do that. <laughs> or anything. <laughs> Juniper does it the best and fastest. So the idea is that you can, yeah, you can totally download uh, this tool. Right, you could go right now to was it code.google.com or whatever it is and download it. And there's binaries or you can do it from source. And you can start fiddling and take advantage of it and start doing stuff. And it's like a central box. You can do stuff like this thing. Yep. So I guess my challenge to you is if you want people to adopt this and there's some very cool stuff there, especially the offloading onto a separate box, is you've got to, you have to have the community that starts sharing their own scripts back and you have to have somebody go to find that stuff so that people get that. If you, at the very least, they get a little step ladder to start them up the hill. Right? Somebody that says, I can copy that and do the first thing. And let me add one thing to it. What's different about it this time around? Right. So let me, let, I'm, I'm actually going to announce something today that we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> so there's uh, two good questions that came up. The first one of which is how do you get more samples and libraries of code? We have that. We have a Juno scriptorium. We have a set of Google code where people are actually contributing different scripts. The next one of which is actually a much more important question, which is what is Juniper doing with this that you can actually pick up and run? And by the way, let's say you want to use this and you don't want to learn Slacks. How do you still take advantage of this technology? So what we are doing is we're actually building a way that we can productize applications that are built using this technology. We're actually shipping the first one today. It's not up on the website yet. It should be any time now, right, Mike? <laughs> it's, uh, and we're actually starting small, but I, I think this is actually an important part of the strategy, is the realization that not only do we want to build a toolkit and a community that people can use to build their own applications, but for the 80th percentile of people who maybe don't want to learn Slacks or don't want to actually build these applications, <clears throat> how do we deliver them something that they can start using today? So we actually started this process off. We have a set of solutions engineers that actually go and work directly with customers and solve interesting management problems. We have this brilliant guy named Jeremy Shulman who has gone out and written a bunch of interesting applications. And we picked the first one basically because we are, there's a lot of work in a vendor to actually creating a product. There's amazing amounts of work, trust me on this. It's been the last couple of months of my life. But you have to not only develop and prototype these applications, but you also have to make them consumable. We have to document them well. We have to provide a common way that you can start to extend them. They read configuration files. You don't, have to mod you don't have to modify the scripts. We have to package these. You can easily download these and install them and run them. And you have to be able to get support on these when they're actually delivered. This is how we have to also be able to deliver this code. And it is still written in Slack. You can still look at the code. But the whole idea is you don't have to. It's actually an application and a product you can use. So we are shipping the first one today. It's actually an operational tool. It, is, it does something that sounds seemingly simple, but it's a huge deal for a lot of customers. That we actually have customers waiting for this, where it allows you to go into a network change window. And let's say you're going to make a change to OSPF or BGP. You program it to take a snapshot of a bunch of state. You say, I want you to show me everything that's going on with OSPF and BGP and save it. You program it. It's a config file. You say, you know, pull this information from BGP or OSPF. And it can save that. You do your maintenance window, and you come back. And what's the first question you always ask? 
What are the risks? Back out? Yeah. Is it safe? Do I have to back out? Well, what happens if all the work that you take that goes into a change control event in terms of documentation of mops and stops, how do you also build in a test that says, this is what I'm going to test, and actually deliver a config file that'll do this for you, and have a tool that automatically reads that config file, pulls the state, and analyzes it. It also has a set of policy. You can, you can have it tell you, you know, if you have fewer than one OSPF uh, neighbor on this interface, throw up a flag, throw up an error. And you build it on this technology. That's exactly what we're delivering. It's called Juno Snapshot Administrator. It's the idea you take a snapshot of state and then you do policy checking on this. And the whole idea is it's a Lego. It solves one specific operational problem. <laughs> You're done. I, and that's I did that with my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually the first thing that we're shipping. But the whole idea of this is the realization that this is how we start building and delivering these Legos to you. So you can start doing interesting things. We call it a Junos workflow automation app because the whole point is it's targeted towards workflows, targeted to do something to make your life easier. The other key is we want to bound it so it does something specific. This just does snapshots of state, but it does it really well and it's very extensible and configurable. We also have other things in the pipeline that start to get even more exciting. We have thing, we're, we're looking at one that will automatically do templatization of configuration and generation of large meshes of devices. And it's a simple tool that just has a configuration file that drives that. These are built in automation. They actually run in this juice environment. You don't even have to run them on the device itself. And they speak so, Netcon. What's the licensing and pricing model? Um, free. More importantly, BSD license. It is Slack's code. Uh, in order to be supported, if you I'm make sorry, changes, Jer we can. Jeremy, what did you say? I said, more importantly, it's BSD licensed. Hmm. That's kind of awesome. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> 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 it. means there's no GPL, negative GPL. You don't have to worry about it. Keep that man yeah, Keep that man yeah. right. The intent for this is actually not to stop you from modifying them. We just need to put, we do want to support them, so we need to put bounds on them. Yeah. If you modify them, we can't support them. However, you're free to take these and start extending these. If you're smart enough to break it, you're smart enough to fix it. Cheers. Well. So if well, we really circle back. Do you really know? <laughs> <laughs> so if we really circle back, we're trying to answer a pretty big question. What, where is Junos going in the next three to five years? How do we make this more relevant? It's important to be able to connect the network infrastructure with the rest of the network. And to do that, we need to build tools. Adding simple things like curl allow you to do amazing things in terms of actually getting access to data outside the network. But there's also this idea of how do we start solving these individual problems so that we can create a pipeline and a library of these things that you can now start to build your operations on top of. And we think this is actually one of the key portions of where Junos is going. So with that, I don't want to keep you guys from more beer and dinner anymore, but uh, do you have any other questions? One quick comment. It's a cool, catchy name, but you need to tell people how to spell it. Because Juice. Uh... J-U-I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so first of all, let's be clear. Juice, J-U-I-S-E, Juniper UI scripting environment. That is actually an open source project, by the way. So we are shipping that as part of, we're shipping the binaries as part of some of these applications that we're releasing. But the Juice binary itself is actually available on top of Google Code. Or from Google Code, rather. Indeed. So what happens to the happy people as they climb up? They find happiness and spirituality and they do well. unicorns. And so actually we, so yeah, let's, let's bring this back to yeah. the Sherpa. What have we done? Like, so if we're the Sherpas, where are we trying to take people so far? Yeah. Right, so, so this is, uh, some, you just asked, like, what is different this time? And this is the thing. The, there's been tools to do automation. They've been out there for a long time. And is it vastly different? Well, we have people up here who are looking out into the valley and they're wondering what features are, are required to start enabling some of the cool unicorn stuff we're seeing over here, right? And you actually hear loads of hype from other companies that are up here, SDN, whatever, orchestration companies. And we think what we really need to do is start helping people move forward. What is, if you're at, if this is a scale of one to 10, right? One meaning that you think automation is writing a big long script and you just don't have time to do that. And 10 being, you know, you're at the peak of automation awesomeness and everything is great, right? 
If you're at one, what is it going to take to get you to two, or three, or four? And the rest of the numbers, right? It would be really cool if we could start pulling people this way. Instead of standing or telling you, you know, hey, by the way, automation is going to save your life. I believe that. But I'm not going to tell you that. What I want you to have is the realization that automation can help you do things, make you more effective at operating that thing that scrolled up, that huge pantheon of screens you've got to deal with to troubleshoot problems. We've got to get you from one to two, and from two to three, and et cetera. So if there's a difference, the difference is what can we do to help you do that, right? And actually, we, we missed this. Part of the, I said when I opened up that we really wanted feedback, right, on the kinds of problems you guys are dealing with. We, we actually do want that, right? I mean, I saw, he was talking about the snapshot, and uh, Colin, your eyeballs rolled in the back of your head. You're like, oh, and you drink your beer, right? So that might not have been super <laughs> I didn't interesting. Want to be a yeah. Dick and call you out. Yeah, well, you know, but you know what? That, that tool is actually um, helpful. Like, we, from customer to customer, we get varied reactions. And what we're realizing is it's not about whether every customer thinks that's the awesomest thing in the world, but some customers, it helps them. So what tools for you, if you don't like the snapshot tool. It's not that I don't like it. It's, a, it's already implemented. You didn't have to say it. I could see the hate coming out of your eyeballs. <laughs> if, uh, you if, know, no, but seriously, what seriously. would help you? Like, if you could sit down and think, in the networks that you deal with, Colin, if, if, if you could sit down and think, wow, it'd be, actually it'd be kind of cool if they did this little thing that would make my life easier. So That's for all of you to think it's, about. It's not one little thing, though, right? And it's much... It's, There's many things. Well, I'll, I'll be camping out here at house for the next three weeks with a list saying what the pain points are, right? So, I mean, it, it's a big store. So, while I appreciate what this is, it's, you know, there's got to be that long vision that's saying, and if that's in a silo inside of any company, or if that's not, you know. I mean, Netcom and XML have already done so much more than SMMP can do or Expect can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you probably. How yes. many times have we all scripted freaking login because there's no SM, there's no MID, so we got to simulate an engineer logging in and scrape some commands from another system because that's how our provisioning works. And then, you know, stuff them into the buffer and you know off we go. That's poor man's provisioning, right? So, I mean, there is. I mean, I like it. It's awesome that you can actually run stuff like that. You know, on the route, actual router, right? It has it has applications. I think. You know, there's some question about overall when you have like 500 routers or switches. I don't know that you're going to be hitting every one. You're going to be more, you know, as you said, scraping data, right? And then occasionally you might have to call out to that and run something on it, right? Yep. So I think the net complex ML interfaces are awesome. I think the problem, as you said, there's only a few, you know, Derek's around or others that really understand it that can kind of bring it together. And then how do you drop it onto a customer's network when they have no clue of what we're talking about? They've never heard the word Perl before. They don't know what CentOS is. And, mm -hmm. you know, they just can't put those, you know, those terms together. So. But the fact that you put the interface in there, which is basically, to me, is an, you know, as, as a comp sci grad, is an API, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, take to the code, write it, you know, give the help desk all the ability, give those layer one engineers all the ability to move ports in the VLAN, set duplex, set port speeds, you know, disable ports, enable ports, you know, I mean, so, I mean, I, I, I like it. You know, the problem is, okay, now, what, what can we do with it? It's pretty cool, but, okay, what can we do with it? And then thinking of the cases. I can think of a few, but, you know. I think, and I think the other key here is if we make a big full-blown product that does something, what we're doing is we're baking in a workflow of how something works from our point of view. That is a valid way to do it. We have products that do exactly that. But there's always cases where people want to do a subset of that. So, yes, you're right. Some of this functionality does exist in other products. However, the idea here is to make it standalone. Well, and by the way, I'm in no way knocking on it. And please, please don't take my lack of sleep and too many beers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, a for a, a useful example, I mean, we've, we've all had to, uh, especially on the service provider side, um, take some complex operational procedures and simplify them in the device level for ops teams, right? Um, you even think you do, in a classic, you know, ISP side, you know, looking at BGP looking glass, mm -hmm. what do my routing tables look like somewhere else? Somewhere else, I made a change. Something you cannot implement locally, and you can li literally, Check my route. You could you could write a script, say check my route, which would go query a CGI script one of the many many available looking glasses. You could implement the using this tool. Very simple service writer writing to target market, right? It's fine. You know, I'm 
Please, please don't take the, the, the eyeballs of hate. <laughs> okay, right. I have a mouth of hate. I'll, I can use <laughs> I'll give you an example of something I had to do on Tuesday before I got on a plane to come here. And, and there might be a way to do this now, but I don't know what the hell it is. Um, not on your switches, by the way. They have guys over on the other side. Um, I have a user whose phone didn't register. It's invisible to me now. It has an automatically private IP configured address, but I know it's MAC address because I had the lady flip it over and read it off to me. So if I had, but I don't know what switch it's attached to because my junior engineers can't name switches. So if I had a tool that could go out and query for each switch the entire MAC table, mm -hmm. and I can find that and what VLAN is configured on that port to put that switch in the, or put that phone in the right port to receive its configuration because those phones don't work well with that VLAN auxiliary thing. That would be awesome because then instead of me having to tell them to the switch, log in, <coughs> show neighbor, not there, back out, go to the next switch. If I could just get that in a table and go there, 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 okay, there it is. Let's go to that switch, fix yeah. it. So, so I'll close because uh, Steve, cool. this very I'm handsome man. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'll close, <laughs> right? It's, uh, right? Cross reference. You're a very handsome man, Steve. You know you are too. <laughs> um, so if you know, what, you know that was a great example, uh, Colin. Great example, Tom. If you guys can think of little things like that, you know, we'd be interested in hearing about them, right? Because simple, discreet things like that make people's lives easier. And the more that we can push them out, encourage people to even make their own, the more tools there are that people can use. Someone else will find that. Some other person angry on the internet is Googling and they'll find it and they'll think that you are awesome because you shared it with the world, right? That's, that's what it's about, sharing with the world. <laughs> Somewhere on the wow. internet, some Google user is angry. <laughs> it's an internet first. <laughs> it's an internet first. All right. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. Hold on.